And so, Lord, I bring myself, I, we bring our insecurity, our shame, that nagging fear and anxiety, the sense that I'm not enough, that we're not enough, uh, that keeps us hidden. Lord, our self-righteousness, our arrogance. Lord, we um, bring it all to the table and our thanksgiving for your life rising in us, for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and control of self. We bring all of these things, Lord, we bring ourselves to the table, at least with our lips we do it, God. And now we ask that you would preach to our hearts, that you would proclaim gospel to us. In Jesus' name we ask it, amen. Close. Oh, come on! Good morning, Miss Tate. I need you around this weekend. You have a problem with that? No, I, I, I just my grandmother's 90th birthday, so I, I was gonna go home and it's fine. I'll cancel it. Is that your family? Yes. They tell you to quit? Every single day. Margaret Tate's office. This isn't about my second raise, is it? Margaret, your visa application is denied. You're being deported. Deported? It's not like I'm an immigrant or something. I'm from Canada. If you're deported, you can't work for an American company. If there was any way at all that we could make this thing work. Pardon the interruption. Um... I understand the predicament, but there is something that you should know. We are, uh, we're getting married. Who, who is getting married? You and I. You and I are getting married. Yes. We are getting married. We are getting married. Yes. Can't fight a can't fight a love like ours. So uh uh are we good? Make it all legal and we'll put this whole thing behind us. Can you imagine getting married for the wrong reason? Like just taking care of business? Or maybe because you want somebody's stuff, like you want to get into their country. Can you imagine coming to worship for the wrong reason? Like, you know, just taking care of business, um, wanting to fulfill some law or some requirement, or just, you know, wanting somebody's stuff, like, I don't know, their kingdom or something. Imagine worshiping God not because it was your life, but because you felt like you had to. Can you imagine that? I'm not sure that we can imagine really anything else. I'm not sure that we can imagine anything but using love for our own purposes, at least in our present state while we're swimming against a river of lies. I, I don't think we can imagine anything but using love while simply loving love seems almost unimaginable. And God is love. So maybe... God starts with our, with our bad motives because that's kind of like the only motives we got. So how many of you have seen that movie, The Proposal? Yeah? yeah? If you haven't seen the movie, don't worry. You don't really need to. In fact, I think you kind of basically got the plot just, just now. It's a good movie, but uh, Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds, the two, I don't remember what their names are in the movie, but if you saw that, you know what's going to happen. They're going to go through the motions of love with bad motives. Greed, lust, fear, self-centeredness. But by going through the motions of love, their bad motives will turn into good motives. Fake love will turn into real love, and they'll actually fall in love. Maybe uh, even form a covenant of love and maybe even produce, give birth to life. The way in which real love conquers fake love is called romance. The joy with which ego is sacrificed to grace is called comedy. The miracle, the miracle of love suddenly appearing in the stinky manger of each of our self-centered hearts, I think that's called the gospel. You were a real kiss. Sweet. 
Did you see that? Did you see the spark? The fire? They're faking their engagement in order to convince everyone that their love is real so that they in turn will convince the immigration authorities when they're interviewed that their engagement is real. But grandma notices that their kisses, well, they lack passion, and so she yells, give her a kiss! Give her a real one! They fake it, and then they make it. Or it makes, makes them. If you're married, I bet that story is also your story in, in one form or another. But what if you've been married for 30 years, 40 years? How do you keep that fire burning? An army officer just home from the wars was dining alone, writes Fulton Orsler. He noticed a beautiful woman seated alone at a nearby table, not much more than 40, he thought, and beautiful. So feminine, so lovely, and attired in such discreet and exquisite style. Why would she be dining alone, he wondered to himself. A moment later, he noticed a man being seated at another nearby table. This newcomer was a tall, well-knit man with iron gray hair. At once, this man noticed the lonely lady sitting so near and yet so far. The look of admiration that flashed into his eyes was unmistakable. Quietly, he called the waiter, ordered dinner, then borrowed the waiter's pencil. Tearing a sheet of paper from a notebook, he wrote a message, folded it, and gave it to the waiter. And now the observer watched intently. The note was carried directly to the lady. She showed no visible sign of surprise, but with a sweet composure, opened the note and read it. Then she folded it, thrust it to one side, and with merely a lift of her eyebrow, dismissed the waiter without any reply at all. The army officer, watching from the corner, sighed. Good try, he thought. What a shame. They'd make a lovely couple. He watched the gentleman attack his dinner, roast beef Yorkshire pudding. The lady, meanwhile, teased a lamb chop in a frilly little paper pantalette. After a time, the tall gentleman paid his bill. He stood up and for a moment let sad eyes fall upon that unresponsive lady. And then he crossed over. He crossed over to her table. He bent low and whispered a few words in her ear. She stared at him blankly and made no sound. Even when the tall gentleman pulled out a chair and sat down beside her, still she said not a word to him. The waiter brought the lady's bill. The gentleman reached for it, but with an imperious gesture, she stopped him. Leaving a pound note in the waiter's hand, she rose, and her visitor, he stood up with her. He followed her out into the spring night, and the observer in the corner never saw them again. At that, he turned to the waiter, chuckling as he said, this is a fine sort of thing. Flirtations going on in a fine and fancy restaurant like this. And then he noticed the waiter's face. The light in the man's eyes was like a prayer. Ah, oh, sir, he said, you do not understand. Now, I don't know if he had a French accent, but he should have. He said, you do not understand. What you have seen tonight is a great love. This is the 26th time I have seen it. I saw it happen the very first time. That was how it began. Twenty-six years ago, at these very same tables, I served them both that night. As I did tonight, with one glance, they fell in love. I carried the note to her then, and when she did not answer, he get up and he come over anyhow. He was that smitten with her, and God blessed them both. He is still that smitten with her, and she that smitten with him. Every year on the anniversary of their first meeting, they come here and they go through the whole drama again and may that love never, never, never die. What you have seen tonight is a great love. Fulton Orsler writes that the story was told to him by a man who couldn't remember where he heard it, and so he didn't know if it, act, if it had actually happened. But maybe it is actually happening. 
right now. At one point, each of us dined alone. God himself wrote a note, wrapped it in human flesh. And we wrapped it in swaddling clothes, placed it in a manger. He crossed over, he bent down, he paid the bill, he placed it on the table, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. You know, if we just do this, perhaps it's only an empty ritual. But if we do this in remembrance of him, maybe the fire will fall. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Love is strong as death. Passion, fierce as hell. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Now, that's the verse we preached last time as we continued to talk about Solomon and the fact that we're all being taken on a walk. Remember? Come on, take a little walk with me, baby, and tell me, who do you love? The walk is a romance and a comedy. It's the gospel. Well, when Solomon was a young man, his father, King David, gathered together all the leaders of Israel, and he charged Solomon in their presence, saying, Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you, Solomon, to build a temple, a house, as a sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. Do the work for the sanctuary. That, by the way, is why we call our church the sanctuary, not because this is like a, a safe place. The temple was hardly anything that people would call a safe place. In fact, you could argue that there was no place less safe in all the world than the temple. And yet in another way, there was no place more safe. Well, anyway, David gives Solomon, the son of David, all the plans for the temple according to the Holy Spirit's instructions they've given him. And then he charges him in the presence of all these people, saying, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. About 15 years ago, I was reading 1 Chronicles 28 in bed. Now, I do that regularly, like about once every three, four decades, I read 1 Chronicles 28. I read it a couple times through, I remember, because I kept falling asleep and I thought to myself, I bet there's something important here, but I'm just not getting it. In the morning, I opened my emails and I found a note from a woman I didn't know at the time, although she's part of our fellowship now, and this is what she wrote. Peter, I know you can get discouraged, and I know you're facing some matters with the heads of the church, but do not lose hope. And then she cited 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20. And then my world blew up. And then we started building the sanctuary. Well, anyway, David gives these instructions to the son of David, and then he dies. Three years later, Solomon starts building the sanctuary, the temple. Solomon, you know, like we've been talking about, wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. But before he wrote the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6, love is the very flame of the Lord, before he wrote that, I bet he dedicated the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer while dedicating the temple, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now, let me remind you, that was not the first time that that had happened, or something like that had happened. At the dawn of recorded history, 2,000 years before Christ, God called um, Abraham. And you remember he cut a covenant with Abraham. It's the first instance of fire in Scripture. Abraham saw a fiery torch or a flaming torch and a pot of fire pass between the halves of slaughtered animals, animals that he had slaughtered early that, earlier that day, as the Lord recited to him unconditional promises, the, the covenant. Not much later, fire falls on Sodom and Gomorrah. 
after God begs him to, to save, after Abraham begs God to save Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it's a, it's a wonder. Um, it's no wonder that we get confused and, and ask, is the fire good or, or evil? Well, about 500 years after that, Moses sees the fire, remember, in a bush that's not, that's not consumed. And then Moses leads the people out of Egypt as they follow a pillar of fire. And then God comes down surrounded by darkness and yet as fire upon the mountain. It was to Moses that God gave the detailed instructions for building of the tabernacle, which functioned as a mobile temple. The day they dedicated the tabernacle, quote, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the offering on the altar and all the people fell down and worshiped. They were to keep that fire going perpetually like an eternal fire. About 500 years after that, King David built an altar on Mount Moriah and fire came down and consumed the offering and that's how David decided upon the location of the temple. We read about that in 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 28, David tells Solomon, do the work. 2 Chronicles 5, Solomon and all Israel have done the work. It has involved stonemasons, carpenters, artists, accountants, kings, janitors, peasants, everything in between, plus a journey of like a thousand years in order to build this temple. And now the priests take the ark from, from the tabernacle and place it in the inner sanctuary of the temple as other priests offer more sheep and more oxen than anyone can count, and as 120 other priests blow trumpets, and as musicians and choirs lead all the people in a song, Second Chronicles 5.13, and when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. The priest can't stand, but Solomon stands, and then Solomon kneels at the altar and then prays the most beautiful of prayers, asking that, quote, all the people of the earth would come to know the Lord God the way Israel knows the Lord God, Second Chronicles 6.33. He then prays, and now arise, O Lord of God, and go to your resting place. That's 6.41. It's at that point that the priest must have put the ark in the inner sanctuary, the inner sanctuary, which is the very presence of the age to come, when all is at rest because all is filled with God, who is a consuming fire. Chapter 7, verse 1, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. It's like they can't stop singing that line. You know, that's the most repeated line in scripture. It appears something like 42 times, most of them in, in the Psalms. They can't stop singing it, and as they sing it, they offer 22,000 more oxen, 120,000 more sheep. That is a lot of sheep. They feast for seven days. They add an eighth, which in the Hebrew mind is a picture of an endless seventh and the age to come. They party until Solomon sends them to their homes, quote, joyful and glad of heart. You see, when the fire filled the temple, it's like all that work became a dance. It's as if the law had suddenly been filled with life. They sang, he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Many have sung that, but very few seem to believe that. Adam and Eve couldn't sing it because they didn't know what it was. They couldn't sing, he is good, for they didn't know what the good is. 
they had no knowledge of good and evil. You should believe your Bible. They had no knowledge of good and evil. Jesus said, listen closely, none is good but God alone. John writes, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. That means Jesus is like the heart of God or the decision of God, the judgment of God, and he is good. When we take his life, we come to know that he has always given his life. Jesus is the revelation of the good, who is the life given to us on a tree in a, in a garden. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the revelation of love. In the same way, the ark was a revelation of love. It was literally the law on stone placed in a coffin. Coffin and ark are the same word in Hebrew. And covered with blood, which is revealed as mercy. Mercy is life given to us when we definitely do not deserve it. That's mercy. Julian of Norwich agrees with Scripture when she writes this. God is all that is good. And God has made all that is made. And God loves all that he has made. They sang, he is good. In reference to God, the word good cannot simply be an adjective. It must be a noun. God is not defined by something else that we call the good. God is the good which defines everything else that we call good. But he not only defines the good, he is the good in everything that's anything. And so evil in you is an emptiness in you, destined to be filled with him, just as the glory of God filled that old stone temple. They sang, he is good, but very few actually sing that line and mean it. Then they sing, his steadfast love, Hasid, endures forever. And if you sing that line and actually mean it, you'll probably be called a heretic. And you could get yourself kicked out of a synagogue or a church. His steadfast love endures forever. Lamentations in Je last, Jeremiah clarifies in Lamentations writing this. The steadfast love, Hasid of the Lord, never ceases. It never stops. His mercies, Rachamim, this is such a cool word. It comes from the word for womb. His tender, compassionate, motherly feelings never come to an end. They never come to an end. Why? Because they are the end. Hell cannot be the end if rachamim is the end. If hesed is the end, if steadfast love is the end, in other words, if Jesus is the end, he said, I am the beginning and the end. They sang his good, his steadfast, he's good, his steadfast love endures forever. I doubt they really mean it in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, but they sing it because David commanded them to sing it over and over and over and over again in the Psalms. I don't think they probably really mean it in 2 Chronicles 5, but they couldn't stop singing it in 2 Chronicles 7. Why? Because the fire had filled the temple. Love had been a law to them. And now it was a life within them after the fire had filled the temple. Tony Campolo told Larry Crabb, who shared the story with me one night at our house at, at dinner, Tony told him that the night he married his wife Peggy, Peggy, who uh, was uh, the, the daughter of a pastor, supposedly a Christian, the night he married Peggy, she told him that she didn't believe in God. <laughs> and so Tony could just say his prayers alone without her. Tony said, imagine that, Larry. I'm a Baptist evangelist, and my wife doesn't believe in God. She didn't believe, but she believed in doing loving things. Years later, she was visiting an elderly dying woman that she somehow knew through their church or whatever, and 
this woman, before she died, she said, Peggy, would you pray for me to receive Jesus into my heart? Peggy knew the words. She couldn't refuse, and so she led this woman in the prayer. And then all at once she knew that she knew God is love. And Jesus is the word of love. She believed. That is, the fire had filled the temple. When I was a youth pastor in L.A., we had a canoe trip designed to introduce the youth to Jesus. And we had a Mexico mission trip designed for the kids who were supposedly already, you know, committed to, to Jesus. And those dumb kids kept giving their life to Jesus on the wrong trip. I mean, I would give this great trip, or this, we'd do this great trip, and I'd give this great talk around the campfire uh, at night, and nothing would happen on the canoe trip. And, and eventually, nobody even wanted to go canoeing anymore, so we canceled the canoe trip. But on the Mexico trip, kids would do these loving things during the day and then tell me at night around the campfire that they believed in Jesus. We eventually had to schedule several Mexico mission trips a year because fire had filled the temple. Years ago, a woman sent me an email in which she explained that she'd always gone, you know, to church with her friends, and she took communion in order to fit in. But the previous Sunday, she, she said, well, Peter, I was sitting there, and I'd been thinking I really need to surrender my heart to Jesus, but I hadn't decided, and the bread was coming down the aisle like we used to do it. And she said she took a piece, she put it in her mouth, and she tried to swallow. Later when I called her, she told me this, Peter, it wouldn't go down. I was literally choking on the bread during the singing. She was choking on Jesus. She said, I was choking on the bread. I ran out of the service, stood out back, and said, okay, Jesus, okay, you can come in. And then I swallowed, and now I'm a believer. The fire had entered the temple. She began to love God, just as Ryan Reynolds began to love Sandra Bullock in the movie, and Sandra Bullock began to love Ryan Reynolds. There was fire now in the kiss. Proskuneo is the Greek word that gets translated worship, and it means literally to kiss. So go to worship and pray for the fire, pray for the fire, pray for the fire in the kiss. In, in other words, try to do the deeds of love and invite the fire that is love. And it's not just how the fire comes to you, it's how the fire is maintained within you, how it grows within you and, and actually becomes you, like that couple celebrating their 26th anniversary of their first meeting and, and doing so by doing the things that they did at first. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, Jesus says this, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Repent and do the things you did at first. When I was a kid, I was required to kiss my sister. But in 11th grade, I kissed this girl, this other girl, and there was fire. It was different. I married that girl, and the fire proved to be life, even took the form of four children. And yet over the ensuing decades, almost four of them now, there have been plenty of times that it's felt as if the fire's grown cold. But when that happens, I know what to do. I make reservations. I schedule some time alone together, and I try, I try to be nice. I try to do the loving things we did at first, and then I don't only feel the loving feelings I felt at first, I feel those things, or at least some of those things, but I feel them on a deeper level. And even in a deeper way, and hopefully one day some French waiter will say to some observer sitting in the corner home from the wars, what you have seen tonight is a great love. Some members of his synagogue approached the great Rabbi Abraham Heschel and they told them that the liturgy, you know, that's the thing we do, the prayers, the songs. Well, I told them that the liturgy just didn't express what they were, you know, feeling. And the great rabbi responded, it's not for the liturgy to express what you are feeling, but for you to learn to feel what the liturgy is expressing. 
So we are to say loving things in order that we might feel loving feelings. And yet I do need to warn you that you must never intentionally lie about the fire. Like Ryan Reynolds and Sandra Bullock lied about love in that movie, The Proposal. You know, immediately after the fire falls on the tabernacle in the wilderness in Leviticus 9 and all the people begin to worship, two of the sons of the high priest, two of the sons of Aaron, take their censers, that's like their little fire pots, and, and they take some fire and they try to offer that fire on the altar. Scripture calls it strange fire or unauthorized fire. And when they do this, fire comes out from the Holy of Holies and consumes them. That'll teach you. You know, when you say things like, oh, I feel such incredible love for God, and you don't really feel such incredible love for God, I think you're offering strange fire, unauthorized fire. The world looks and thinks, you know what, all that, all that fire's fake. I bet there's no real fire. And I believe God says, please, stop taking my name in vain. So instead of that, try to do loving things, try to say loving words, and when you don't feel love, when you don't love love, confess yourself to love. Saying, I don't think I love love. And then call on love to fill the temple. If you confess that you don't love love, but call on love, you won't be burned by love when love does fill the temple. And love will fill the temple. Make no mistake, the fire will fall. So what does it look like when the fire does fall? Well, in Sodom, they didn't love love. Like Ezekiel says, they didn't care for the poor. And from the story, we know that they used sex like a weapon. They didn't love love and so rejected love, and then they were consumed by love that burned like fire. Ezekiel promises that God will make Sodom new. And I believe him. But the process does look rather painful. In Second Chronicles, they do the work of love. They build the temple. They make sin offerings and thank offerings, goats and sheep. They say the words of love. They sing the songs of love. They present the offering of love, and, and they aren't burned by love. Instead, they're filled with love for God and for each other. They cannot stop singing and sacrificing and feasting and partying until Solomon sends them home, quote, joyful and glad of heart. So what they were required to do became the very thing that they passionately, desperately wanted to do. And so what they did do was experienced as freedom. <laughs> we'll talk about that more next week. Fourth of July, freedom. But you see, it's as if each of us is a temple. And love lives in the depths of each temple behind a curtain in a place that each of us is, at first, afraid to go. The thing that doesn't love love is your ego, your flesh, your desire to be first. And the thing that does love love is the breath of God deep inside of you. When Christ sets us free, he sets us free from our ego. He sets us free from our ego in order to free us to love God and everyone around us because we want to. When love is a law, we perceive it as the fire without, and it is. But when we surrender to love, we see that it is the fire within. The veil is ripped and the breath of God, the fire within, floods the temple. One night years ago, I felt the fire so intensely that I thought I was going to die. And strangely enough, I was just happy to die. 
Because I, I, I knew, I knew that dying would be living, truly living for the very first time. I was literally pinned to the floor. I've told you about it. My whole body was like on fire and it was like I just could not stop worshiping because I couldn't imagine ever wanting to stop worshiping. And God said to me, I, I believe Jesus said to them this, Peter, Peter, stop doubting my love for you. And it was like he pulled back the curtain on all of my reality. I saw that wherever I had been loved or did love, wherever I had experienced something good or done good, wherever I had lived life or given life, it wasn't me. It was him in me and him through me and him to me. It was the fire. I think he told me in a language deeper than words, Peter, it's not about this wild experience that you're having right now. It's not about signs and wonders. It's all about love, and I am love. And love is fire, eternal fire. You see, maybe we're meant to fall in love with the fire as a single flame burning in the darkness before the entire world is consumed by fire. Maybe we're to fall in love with a kind deed here, and a nice word there. A nice word even when we don't feel like giving a nice word. A kind deed here, a nice word there before love himself fills all things with himself, the unquenchable fire. Did you know that fire is basically oxidation? It's a redox reaction, the result of a redox. It's basically oxidation, and life is basically Oxidation. I mean, fire is basically the energy emitted when organic matter reacts with oxygen. And the energy that you call, that you call your life, is basically the energy emitted when the organic matter inside of you, we call it food, reacts with oxygen. Oxygen that you breathe, that's why we refer um, uh, to, uh, to exercise. You, you breathe extra hard in exercise, and what do you do? You burn calories. Perhaps the fire that will consume all things already burns behind the curtain in the depths of every human soul. Well, anyway, Abraham saw the fire fall. And 500 years later, Moses saw the fire fall. And 500 years after that, Solomon saw the fire fall and fill the temple. And 500 years after that, the Jews stood in a reconstructed temple and sang, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Ezra chapter 3, verse 11. And there was no firefall. Just a prophecy from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. And 500 years after that, Jesus suddenly came to the temple. He cleansed it of money changers, taking care of business, and he cried out, My Father's house will be a house of prayer for all peoples. He also said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And so they tried to destroy him. But as you know, on the third day he rose from the dead. For 40 days he appeared to his disciples and told them to wait for the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of of fire, and so they waited, but waited wasn't doing nothing. Waited was doing the work. It was building the temple. So what did they do? They gathered together like living stones in the upper room, and there they prayed. And on the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, the fire fell, Acts chapter 2, verse 3. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They began to worship in ecstasy, and people thought they were drunk. In other words, they loved the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and they began to sell all their possessions and share everything in common. I'm sure that's when they really thought they were drunk. In other words, they loved their neighbor as they loved themselves. So love was no longer a law for them. Love was the life that was burning deep within them. And of course, it didn't only happen once, and then it was just over. Over and over and over again, we must do the work and wait upon the Lord for the fire to fall. Seems to me that is exactly what we, the sanctuary, ought to be doing right now. The 
pandemic is over. At least in Denver, it's basically over. So why don't we come together to build the sanctuary? And I don't mean bricks and budgets, but living stones. Why don't we come together in person and wait on the Lord like we're doing right now? And if you can't come in person, then come in spirit as you worship online. People sometimes ask, Peter, what can I do for the church? Number one, come to worship and call on the fire. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And number two, join a community group or something like a community group that we'll be forming in the fall. In other words, um, get together with some folks close to you and call on the fire. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So are you ready to call on the fire? This whole service, you've been wondering if I'm going <laughs> to light this fire. I'm not going to light the fire. I can't light the fire. God has to light the fire. And I don't want to fake the fire. I'm called to testify to the fire. And this is actually not the proper container for the fire. And this is, is really not the, the food for, for the fire. It's not the fuel for the fire. This is the fuel. The Lord, whom we all seek in some one form or another, the Lord whom we sought, suddenly came to his temple. Twelve insecure, frightened, lonely, confused guys in the upper room. Same room in which the spirit would fall, the fire would fall 50 days later. And he took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body given to you, take and eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup and having given thanks, he said, This is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. When we gather, we literally remember his body. The body is made of members, and his body is also the temple. We remember his body, which is the temple, and into that temple we place the fuel for the fire. Jesus said this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And two chapters later, he said, eat me, drink me. I'm your food. My flesh is your food. We place the fuel in the temple and call on the oxygen. It's in the blood. <laughs> and it's in the air all around you. And we wait. We wait to be caught up in the love that is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, we work at worship until worship begins to work us and our lives become the life of the living God, the dance of love. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel, ingest the gospel, and become the gospel. Amen. So, Lord God, we praise you. And all thy work shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. 
And we thank you that you allow us to praise you now. In Jesus' name. And Father, it's our custom to say amen at the end of sermons, but we say it incorrectly most of the time because we think it means stop, and it doesn't mean stop. It means for sure. So, for sure, amen. amen. But don't stop. Don't stop praising God. Don't stop waiting on God. Um, you, you read the story of Acts and the fire fell, and they had this amazing experience. But then they had to go out and deal with all the garbage you have to deal with every day of the week. And then they come back and they wait some more and the fire falls. And one day the fire will fall and we will become creatures of, of, of fire. That's, that's what I really believe. You know, it's pretty cool that when Jesus does communion, when he did, said the words of institution, um, in the Gospels it says they sang a hymn and then they went out. They went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Scholars say that the hymn they would have sung is Psalm 118. It was the end of the Hallel, a group of songs that you sang on Passover. The first line, uh, the first line of this song goes like this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That's, that's how it begins. Do you know how it ends? Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. You know, we're a small church. But I think we're beginning to sing it and mean it. We, we can sing those words and mean those words. He's, he's good. That's why you're on this journey, to see that he's good, to see Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the revelation of the good and the life. His steadfast love endures forever. He's good everywhere and good all the time. So at 50, after, 50, if after 40 days, Jesus ascends, remember, and then at 50, the fire falls, and then in the Gospel of John, he appears to John. And remember what happens? John can't stand. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus is on fire. His face shines like the sun. And he bends down. <laughs> he says, John, it's me. <laughs> Get up. One day he's going to bend down, cross over, bend down, and say to you, Steve, Scott, Mike, Marilyn, it's me. It's me. So keep waiting, keep singing, and may the fire fall. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like prayer, um, Corrine's going to be down front here, right, Corrine? And she'd love to pray with you, and hopefully we'll see you uh, next week. Slow